The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Powermatic, the gold standard since 1921. And by Rockler Woodworking and Hardware. Create with confidence. Now that I'm back in my old shop space, I have got my hands full with projects and things to do before I can actually build my first piece of furniture here. And it all starts with a lumber rack. As you can see, I need one. Now this lumber rack is very easy to build and it just requires two by fours and plywood. You need to attach it to any open space in your wall and here's the great thing, you don't necessarily have to build it to my exact specs. You could downsize things, you could make them bigger, you can make the whole thing longer if you want to. You customize it so it fits your personal needs. Now let's look at some of the materials and we can get started building. Now I just picked up my two by four stock from the local home center. Now keep in mind, not all of these 2x4s are created equal. Some piles are kiln dried, some piles are not. You can even take a, you know, your hand and put it on the board and you'll feel the stuff that's not kiln dried has a lot of moisture coming off of the surface. It feels cold and clammy. This on the other hand, a kiln dried board, generally feels room temperature. Um, you could feel a little bit of moisture in it, and especially here in Arizona, it's a little bit more noticeable. But for the, for the most part, the kiln dried stock is really the way to go. Because what that means to you is that it's a much more stable board. Now, even though this one has a lot of the moisture driven out, especially here in Arizona, there, there's enough in there that this could cause me problems if I wait too long to work with the board. So I bought my boards this morning, and I'm gonna work with them today. And that way I don't have to worry about it. Now, if you do use the regular studs, you absolutely wanna make sure you get those on the wall as soon as possible because they will start to bend and turn into pretzels on you. It's bad news. The other thing to keep in mind is the total length of these boards. I like to have the back of the lumber rack made with single boards. I don't really want multiple boards for each vertical support. So get the length that corresponds to how high you want your lumber rack to be. And if that's eight foot, great. If you can get 10 footers and your ceiling can accommodate 10 foot boards, go for the 10 footers. Just make sure you get them long enough to accommodate the size that you want to build. Wood is stored in an insulated oven where the temperature, humidity, and air circulation are controlled. Excess moisture is driven from the wood over the course of weeks to a month, depending on the species. Now, although you bought your two by fours at the home center, resist the urge to buy the plywood there as well. Unfortunately, that plywood tends to be loaded down with moisture. So as soon as you get it back to your shop, within a couple hours, instead of four by eight beautiful flat sheets, you're gonna have four by eight potato chips. They tend to, to really warp and it just makes it miserable to work with. So instead, I recommend going to your hardwood dealer and asking them about their shop grade plywood. Don't get the cabinet grade stuff. You don't need it for a project like this. It's gonna cost about the same thing that you would pay at the local home center, about 40, maybe 50 bucks a sheet, but it's much more stable. You're gonna have more plies. In fact, mine has 11 internal plies. It's a lot like Baltic birch, where it's a lot more stable over time and it holds a screw really well. So 40 to 50 bucks a sheet, you just can't beat it. Just means you gotta make one extra trip to a different store. Now behind me here is where our lumber rack is gonna go. The first order of business is to find the studs. Our lumber rack needs to support a lot of weight. So it's absolutely vital that these vertical members are attached to studs in the wall. So I use a standard stud finder to basically mark out the locations. And if you're having problems with this, a lot of people don't realize that you can calibrate this very easily by putting it up against a known stud. Did you hear that, right? Uh, obviously I couldn't have a stud finder in my hands and not do a joke. So basically I put the stud finder against the wall, slide it over, and when it hits a stud, it makes a sound and you'll see the red light and it tells you where the center of the stud is. Use that to sort of ballpark the start and stop points. And then from this point on, if you have 16 inch centers, all you need to do <clears throat> is measure across every 16 inches and mark the location of the stud. Now keep in mind, some houses, some garages have 24 inch centers. So you're gonna to wanna to make a change to the plan. Um, I would make sure that you put your verticals, if you have 24 inch centers, put your vertical supports on every one of those studs. 
If you go to the next level, which would basically put a 48 inch gap, a four foot gap between your verticals, that's a little bit too much. I don't feel comfortable doing that. So put your verticals on every 24 inches. For me, since mine are 16 inch centers, I'm gonna put mine every 32 inches. Uh, and I think that should be enough to support the weight that we're looking for. So go all the way down the line, mark the locations of your studs, and that's gonna help us for every part of this project when we need to anchor stuff to the wall. Now the first thing I wanna do is attach a support cleat onto the wall. This is not only going to give us extra support for each one of these vertical members, but it's also gonna make it a lot easier for us to install them. It helps us hold them in place. So just a regular old two by four is gonna work just fine for this. And I've marked already on it every 16 inches cause I wanna attach it with a single screw into each stud down the line. Now, before I drive the screw, I'm gonna pre-drill just because I wanna relieve some of that material and I don't wanna crack the board. And now I'm just gonna go along the length and get each screw started. I'm using three and a half inch Spax screws for these. You could certainly use lag screws if you want to. Now I'm just gonna drop this about 12 to 16 inches up from the floor. I've got a little mark here, but this doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. I'm just gonna get it close. Line up my screw with a known location of one of my studs, and now I can drive the screw. Feel secure, that definitely went into a stud, and now I can continue along the rest of the board. But before I do that, I don't like to have to measure all the way across to make sure it's perfect, I'm just gonna use a level. Oh, and hey, look at this. Scorpion. <laughs> now to get the full length that I'm looking for, I did have to add one additional piece because you know the size that I got wasn't long enough. So uh, one 30 inch extra piece should cover it. Just make sure that the uh, level is on top and helps me make sure everything is nice and even. Now each one of our vertical pieces is gonna receive a number of screws from top to bottom to help secure it to the wall. How many? Well, I mean, it's kind of up to you. I'm gonna probably put mine maybe every 16 to 20 inches all the way up. And just make sure you have one at the top and one near the very bottom. And this way, everything will be locked in place. And now we're gonna pre-drill again. Now, once again, I'm gonna pre-start a screw here, and this one is uh, very similar. It's a Spax screw, but look how long it is. It's actually four and three quarters of an inch, so it's plenty long to go all the way through this board, and we'll uh, recess it by quite a bit, and we'll have a, a really nice amount of a bite into our wall stud. And one thing I should have been a little bit more clear about before is when you pre-drill your hole here, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that that hole is wide enough to take the entire screw without it really catching. You know, not too wide, but just wide enough. And this way, when the screw hits the stud inside the wall, it'll pull this entire assembly forward into the wall. If this screw starts catching on too much material inside our vertical support, they just sort of uh, won't really pull together. So you need to have this just barely sort of loose fit here, and that should really help to pull it into the wall. Now, if you're lucky, you'll be able to just put the stud right up on the cleat and start driving your screws into the wall. My problem is I've got conduit to work around, so I'm gonna to need to mark the location and just use my jigsaw to cut sort of a little scoop out that goes right around the pipe. Perfect. Now we'll start by attaching this with one screw near the bottom. It doesn't have to be the very bottom, but near the bottom. Sort of eyeballing it at this point. So now with one screw in place, you wanna check for level, and basically if one screw is in the stud, assuming that the stud is you know, straight up and down and nice and plumb, you should be able to put your level right against your board, make sure the bubble is nice and centered, and then drive the rest of the screws. And by the way, an impact driver is worth its weight in gold on a project like this.
So now I'm just gonna continue this process, working my way down and installing one piece at a time. Now our shelf supports themselves are gonna be made from a two x four that's sandwiched with two pieces of ply. Now this one's loose, nothing is screwed together yet, but let me show you the components and how we make them. So the one side piece of ply goes down like so. The two x four is added and it's flush with the front. And then the other piece of ply comes in like this. You see, and what that does is it creates almost a open mortise or a little pocket here. And this is gonna go into the vertical support. To make the support brackets, I cut up a bunch of 2x4s to 18 inches in length. For a full-sized rack, you're going to need a lot of these. I then use my track saw to slice 6 inch wide strips from the full sheet of plywood. I find it much easier to break down sheet goods on the floor instead of at the table saw. The plywood strips are then cut to 21 and a half inches long, and remember you're going to need two of these per support. On each piece of plywood, I place a mark 3.5 inches in from the back edge and 3.5 inches down from the top. Then I use a straight edge to connect the lines. The taper can then be cut at the bandsaw since the line really doesn't have to be perfect. And if you're lucky enough to have something like a Festool MFT, you can certainly make quick work of the taper. Once the parts are cut, they can be assembled with glue and screws. A level line across the studs helps me position the supports. Before screwing the support in place, be sure that the stud is making full contact with the vertical support for the ultimate in strength. We don't want any gap here. Now I drive two screws in from each side. And it may be overkill, but I like to add an additional, longer screw to each side that goes all the way through the vertical support and into the piece of ply on the other end. Now speaking of overkill, I decided to make a late game change here. I added a few extra long lag screws to each vertical member just for some extra security. Ah, uh, now that feels better. The next order of business is to construct the plywood cart. The entire thing is made from 3 quarter inch plywood, and the parts are cut to the specifications in the plan. Each joint is put together with glue and countersunk screws. Doesn't get simpler than this. Now these parts are very large, so get a helper if you can, or just get creative using some plywood scraps for extra support. Now before we put this beast on the ground, it's a good idea to attach the casters while we still have access to the underside. The casters that I'm going to use, I just picked these up at Home Depot. They're really heavy duty, cost about 12 bucks each, uh, and they're blue, so they look kind of cool. Um, basically, I'm going to install them on the bottom here, but before I do, I want to reinforce the bottom. There's only one piece of 3 quarter inch ply down here. I'd like to have something a little bit more substantial to bite into, so I'm going to put an extra strip of ply right here at the front where the casters are going to be screwed in. Uh, I can attach it with some glue and screws. And now I'm just going to mark the locations of the holes in each caster, have it roughly centered here. And I'll just pre-drill in the center, just to help the screw get started. And now I'll just drive inch and a quarter wood screws. That bad boy is not going anywhere. Now to install the plywood cart, obviously you're gonna to need to prop up one end a little bit because the one side has casters and the other side doesn't. So I'm just using whatever I had laying around to prop it up to approximately the same height as the casters. Now attaching it to this vertical member here, I'm gonna use one of these gate hinges. It's a pretty big one, so it can take a lot of weight. And I'm gonna attach it like so 
so that the leaf end, this triangular leaf, can be attached to the side of the cart itself. So let's just drill these in with a couple of screws. <clears throat> and now with two hinges installed, we can try to move the whole thing back a little bit here, get it lined up as best we can. There we go. And now we can screw them in place. Now, if all goes well, we should be able to remove the supports. Hopefully you won't hear any wood cracking. And this bad boy should swing right out. Yeah, baby. Now, here's the cool thing. You don't really ever have to move it out much more than this, just enough so that it's convenient to slide sheet goods in and out. And then once they're in place, push it up against the wall. Okay, now I see it's actually coming back out toward me a little bit. So you may want to come up with a little hook system or something to hold it in place. But for the most part, this is looking pretty good. And thankfully, I don't hear any wood cracking. Now I'm just going to attach this nice little handle here for convenience. I should finish it off nicely. Perfect. So you can see I've already got some lumber on the main racks and now we can start loading this guy up. Plenty of room for solid wood and also sheet good scraps here, whatever you want to use those for. And now I'll load up the, the main sheet good rack. Well, there it is, a sturdy and high capacity lumber rack and a sheet goods cart that swings out. It's nice and convenient. It's right by the front door, so I could just pull materials right from the truck and put it right here for processing. So honestly, I'm really happy with the way this turned out. There are a lot of different ways that you could take a project like this. You could add neat little features to it. You could do more to reinforce it. So let me know what you guys do because I'd love to see your changes. But for me, for now, I think this is gonna work uh, pretty good until I start to buy more wood, which seems to always be a problem. So thanks for watching. Of course, check out the plan for this project at thewoodwhisperer.com and we'll catch you next time.